All right, thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for that introduction. That was much nicer than I deserve. And I'm sure as you see me now, I'm so nice. I'm such a sweetheart. He, he was clearly talking about something else. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start with sort of a double preface. First, I'm going to say for the record, and I'm sure that this is a sentiment that everyone here can understand if you don't also share it, and you probably share it. I want to say for the record that it means a lot to me generally to try in my life and my work to do justice to all that Bruce Lee has given me, and it means even more to be able to do that in this room with all of you. So I'm going to start this presentation the same way that I'm going to end it, by thanking you for indulging me. I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to be able to talk about Bruce Lee in this room with all of you. I'm grateful for your time and your attention, and I'm going to try to repay you with an interesting presentation. Second, the reason that I love these martial arts studies conferences is because if you want to know what interdisciplinary is supposed to look like, what that word is supposed to capture, it's this. It's these conferences. I went home last night. I could have easily written my entire presentation so that it would have incorporated all the incredible insights from the many presentations yesterday, the conversations that I had, slash, eavesdropped on. And that's kind of what I did last night until it got close to midnight. And then I said, you got to just stop and say what you have. So I'm also going to try to push some of the possible conversations to be had, emanating from yesterday, from the different things and angles that we come at Bruce Lee from, into what I hope, even for the fans and scholars in this room, will be unfamiliar and maybe uncharted Bruce Lee territory. So we'll see. So with the two prefaces out of the way, the title of this presentation is Dragon Seek's Path, Bruce Lee in the Way of Perfection. I imagine that with that title, we know the basic reference, the line from Tangum's character, the way the dragon is educating the Mamma Mia guy in movement number four, and we all know Bruce Lee. So I imagine that the word in there that needs the most explanation is the word perfection. So to that end, the first portion of this presentation will consist of a rundown of what I call philosophical perfections. Because I know that bright and early in the morning of the second day of the conference, when everyone's very tired and hungover, possibly, there's nothing more exciting or better to perk people up for the rest of the day than hardcore philosophy. Yeah! <laughs> Said one person. <laughs> I know my audience. So, to give you some context, the American philosopher Stanley Cavell devoted the bulk of his late writings to tracing what he identified as a perfectionist lineage throughout the history of Western philosophy. In his 2004 book, Cities of Words, he importantly traced the line that runs from Plato and Aristotle through John Locke to John Stuart Mill to most saliently for Cavell, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Henry David Thoreau. In my own work, I focused primarily on the philosophy of objectivism as it was developed and articulated by the Russian-American novelist and philosopher Ayn Rand, and I've tried to situate that within the line of perfectionist philosophy. I'm also keen to argue for Bruce Lee's position in this particular odd philosophical matrix. And the manifestation specifically in his film. And the way that I'm going to do that is by providing you with what you can think of as kind of like a literature review of the stuff that Bruce himself was working his way through from his time at the University of Washington to the Jeet Kune Do phase to then cinema superstar. With an eye towards connecting it all up with perfection. Obviously, I'm not going to go through the entire histories of film and philosophy. I'd need half a dozen of these slots to even try to do that, and you would need a lot more coffee and patience. So I'd just like to give you the perfectionist basics. I'm just going to take you through enough perfectionism so that my discussion of the way of the dragon will make sense and hopefully inspire you to your own critical assessments in light of what I have to say, which I'm going to be very eager to hear about in the discussion period. As part of the way that I work, I love epigraphs. If I'm writing something, I love just finding a quote, old or new, long or short, I don't care. I just love finding a quote that captures perfectly the sentiment of what's to come. I also like doing that in presentations and lectures, sort of calibrating my words and providing people listening to me with some coordinates so that they can get intellectually situated. Cavell often discussed what he called the thematics, more, the thematics of perfectionism. And his book, Cities of Words, actually begins with four pages of quotes called from random perfectionist thinkers to try to capture the thematic thrust of the book. I'm going to do something very similar here. I'm going to go through three quotes that will give you a general sense of perfectionism, that will foreground what you can think of as the theme of this presentation, and that will outline for you sort of the chronological intellectual trajectory that I'm going to take you through, from Emerson to Rand to the man of the hour, Bruce Lee. Uh, I'm not very fond of technology, so I'm not going to have a flashy PowerPoint or Prez or anything. The extent is going to be just huge quotes that I'm going to throw up on the screen for you to read along with, and then some screen graphs later on. But the first quote that I'm going to take you through is the closing paragraph of Emerson's 1844 essay, Experience. The second quote is an extract from Rand's 1957 novel, Atlas Shrugged. 
And the third quote is a portion of a letter written in 1962 by the time 21-year-old Bruce. Big enough? Readable? So, the first quote this is from Emerson's Experience. I know that the world I converse with is not the world I think. I observe that difference and shall observe it. One day I shall know the value and law of this discrepancy. But I have not found that much was gained by manipular attempts to realize the world of thought. Many eager persons successively make an experiment in this way and make themselves ridiculous. I say this polemically, or in reply to the inquiry, why not realize your world? But far be from me the despair which prejudges the law by a paltry empiricism, since there was never a right endeavor that had succeeded. In the solitude to which every man is always returning, he has a sanity and revelations, which in his passage into new worlds he will carry with him. Never mind the ridicule, never mind the defeat. Up again, old heart, it seems to say. There is victory yet for all justice. And the true romance which the world exists to realize will be the transformation of genius into practical power. Patience and patience, which shall live at the last. Second, from Rand's Atlas Shrug. Every man builds his world in his own image. He has the power to choose, but no power to escape the necessity of choice. If he abdicates his power, he abdicates the status of man. And the grinding chaos of the irrational is what he achieves as a sphere of existence by his own choice. Whoever brings into reality a matchstick or a patch of garden made in the image of his thought, he, and to that extent, is a man. And that extent is the sole measure of his virtue. Third from a guy you may have heard of before. When you drop a pebble into a pool of water, the pebble starts a series of ripples that expand until they encompass the whole pool. This is exactly what will happen when I give my ideas a definite plan of action. Right now I can project my thoughts into the future. I can see ahead of them. I dream. Remember the practical dreamers never quit. I may now own nothing but a little place down in a basement, but I am not easily discouraged. I readily visualize myself as overcoming obstacles, winning out over setbacks, and achieving impossible objectives. I feel this great force, this untapped power, this dynamic something within me. Yesterday, Matthew Polly posed the question, how big were Bruce's balls? Big enough to put that on paper and then make it a reality. It's my contention that the dynamic something that fueled Bruce Lee throughout his life was perfectionism. We heard Matt's answer yesterday to the question, if Bruce Lee had a philosophy, what was it? Which was the kind of general default answer. Taoism, Watts, Krishnamurti, basically a mysticism recipe with some West Coast hippie thrown into good measure. And that's not wrong, but it's not right either. I don't think he's here, so forget it. It's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff is in there. But it doesn't so much as touch that dynamic something. That's not to say I'm breaking radical new ground here. I'm not. This dynamic something has been recognized, at least in outline, by Daniele Bolelli. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Daniele Bolelli in his On the Warrior's Path, though he goes the Nietzsche route, and for my money, if you go Nietzsche instead of Emerson, that's like Bruce Lai or Bruce Led instead of Bruce Lee. You're going the wrong way. And also by Megan Morris, who some of you might have heard of before, in her excellent essay, Learning from Bruce Lee. So I'm not inventing something new here. I merely wish to name that which a few scholars have intuited or identified in Bruce Lee's films and philosophy, contextualize it, and elaborate it. As I mentioned, perfectionism has a very long history, but the best definition or characterization of perfectionism that I've come across was one provided by Rain. In Atlas Shrugged, she defines perfectionism as an unbreached rationality. That can be your key phrase, a little conceptual nugget to hold on. When first confronted with the notion of perfectionism, one may feel the urge to demand that you produce a perfect person. It's usually an indignant, if not insolent, request. Like, show me someone who's perfect. Come on, show me a perfect person. Yeah, that's my thought, stupid. That's usually the tone of it. And to my ears, what I hear in that demand is that the concept of perfection doesn't belong in the realm of human beings. So the type of person who feels compelled to respond to the notion of perfectionism in this way, I would want to ask them, what is your standard of perfection? To this type of person, it seems that perfection is not human. It's inhuman. It's superhuman, supernatural, perhaps divine. Perfection is an otherworldly phenomenon that has no place in this world. Beyond slanting towards a tragic view of life that can too easily, for my taste, open out into nihilism, this position also portrays a mystic and usually invariably a religious worldview. Perfectionism is the antithesis. This comes to light in Rand's elaboration on her characterization of perfectionism. To unpack the idea of an unbreached rationality as the mark of human perfection, Rand argued that man has a single basic choice, to think or not, to be rational or irrational, to use your mind or to just leave it alone, to 
think things through and act on the basis of reason and convictions, or to just go through life hoping that everything will work itself out somehow. And that, that choice is the gauge of one's virtue. As she explained, it's not about the degree of your intelligence. It's about the full and relentless use of your mind. It's not about the extent of your knowledge. It's about the acceptance of reason as an absolute. Perfectionism is not a state of being. It's a state of mind. Perfection is not a place you arrive at and then stop. For to stop in life is the opposite. It's to die. Perfectionism is the way you conduct yourself, no matter the place you happen to be at any given moment of you. Now, if I've established the basic definition of perfectionism, kind of, uh, unreached rationality, a conduct of life premised on a volition of consciousness that can and ought to think its way through life, then what's next for me to establish is the basic practice of perfectionism, what it looks like, what you do. Though Cavell considers Plato's Republic to be the first real portrait of perfectionism, it fell to Aristotle to articulate explicitly and comprehensively the first problem of perfectionist philosophy. With reference to Aristotle's ethics, Cavell asks, who could put the general issue of perfectionism more strongly, or with deeper reference to what is central in philosophizing at large? Then Aristotle saying, we are insofar as we are actualized, since we are insofar as we live and act. As Cavell expounds, Aristotle emphasizes myself, this individual, the development of my character, as the touchstone of goodness and rightness. This is the point to me at which Rand's primarily Aristotelian conception of perfectionism and Cavell's primarily Emersonian conception of perfectionism align. And this point regarding the importance in perfectionist philosophy of individualism, self-actualization, and of self-reliance in the quest for, in Emerson's phrasing, one's unattained but attainable self. Emerson, of course, was vociferous in his emphasis on self-reliance and sovereignty of the individual. A particular point to Emerson was the Aristotelian notion of character. Cavell observes that for Aristotle, it is as if each thing that exists is striving to become what it is, to realize itself. Emerson glosses this idea in the following A character is like an acrostic or Alexandrian stanza. Read it forward, backward, or across. It still spells the same thing. Let me record day by day my honest thought without prospect or retrospect, and I cannot doubt it will be found symmetrical, though I mean it not and see it not. For character teaches above our wills. Men imagine that they communicate their virtue or vice only by overt actions, and do not see that virtue or vice emit a breath every moment. This is like much of Emerson's writing, a deceptively dense passage that requires a little bit of unpacking. It may be clear that Emerson considers each individual fated to a given character, from which he can escape and which is powerless to change. By and large, because the people who make that mistake do not see that virtue or vice in the breath every moment. That is to say, because certain people delude themselves into believing that they're pulling a fast one on reality and successfully getting away with being rational, or weak, scared, or what have you. It may seem as if they are fated to remain rational, or weak, scared, or what have you. Due to this grave error, such people never so much as begin the work of changing their character. Emerson attempts to articulate the way out of this deadlock in his essay, fittingly titled Fate. Forever wells up the impulse of choosing and acting in the soul. Intellect annuls fate. So far as a man thinks, he is free. Tis weak and vicious people who cast the blame on fate. Tis the best use of fate to teach a fatal courage. Go face the fire at sea, or the collar in your friend's house, or the burglar in your own, or what danger lies in the way of duty, knowing you are guarded by the Jerusalem of destiny. If you believe in fate to your harm, believe instead for your good. Far from condemning people to their lot in life, and thereby absolving people of their responsibility to actualize themselves and seek their unattainable attainable selves, Emerson encouraged a perspectival shift from pessimism to optimism, according to which what human beings are fated to do, or fated to do anything, is to commit ourselves to being as intelligent and as virtuous as we can possibly be. In the interest of time, this is going to be the extent to which I'm going to talk about perfectionism as such. I'm going to content myself with having established the basic definition and practice, to the extent necessary to now turn to Bruce Lee. So the question that I'll now take as standing before me is, where exactly does Bruce Lee fit here? In my quest to understand the perfection of Bruce Lee, what I found to be the first and primary point worth making is that the one thing about Bruce that has never gone unremarked and that is unanimously agreed upon is his resolute individualism. Bruce Thomas describes Bruce's philosophy as a fierce philosophy of individualism, in which Lee insists, in the Aristotelian and Soviet spirit, that self-mastery should be the goal of all human endeavor. Daniele Bolelli argues that, in his formulation of Jeet Kune Do, Bruce took the bull of group identity by the horns and challenged the sensibility of the human desire to belong. 
too afraid to bear the weight of choosing on their own. Many people hide behind the security of a group that provides all the answers. According to Lee, however, this is the way to hide, not a way to live. James Bishop puts the point most succinctly when he observes that Bruce seemed to be the type for whom the term individual is coined. Recalling the dynamic something quote from Bruce's 1962 letter that I discussed earlier, the letter in which he prognosticated his success, which would obviously follow from the application of his mind to a rational plan of action in pursuit of the goals he was confident he had more courage to achieve. More than a decade later, Bruce, reflecting on his journey now on the other side of success, reaffirmed across a series of journal entries that ever since I was a kid, I have possessed within myself this instinctive urge for growth and daily expansion of my potential. That to his mind, the function and duty of a human being, quality human being, that is, is the sincere and honest development of his potential and self-actualization. That there is no end or limit to this, because life is simply an ever-going process. That he thought that the moral strength required to take responsibility for one's actions, good and bad, was a strength that every individual must cultivate daily. That for the lazy and hopeless, they can forget it and do what they like. For the self-reliant individual willing to shun the lazy and the hopeless in an Emersonian spirit, he must learn to stand on his own two feet and find out his cause of ignorance. And that in his personal perfections quest, he was able to report a profound sense of accomplishment and fulfillment insofar as he was consistently growing daily and honestly. Now, to get the full perfectionist picture of Bruce Lee, I obviously have to go through his time conceptualizing Jeet Kune Do before getting to his film. But in the interest of time, I'm going to leapfrog over all of that. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to explore the philosophical dimensions of Jeet Kune Do in a future publication, maybe for that martial arts studies journal I keep hearing about. But uh, for my purposes here, there's one point that I'd like to make. For obvious reasons, I think that Bruce's 1971 essay, Liberate Yourself from Classical Karate, marked the culmination of what I call his philosophical project in the martial arts. For the remainder of his life, he went full steam ahead with his film career and shifted from working out the details of Jeet Kune Do to exemplifying its practice and demonstrating its value in the context of cinematic and, in case, long street television narratives. The point that I'd like to make, which I find fascinating given my interest in both Bruce Lee and Ayn Rand, pertains to Bruce's artistic intentions upon turning from teaching martial arts in the form of classes, demonstrations, and articles to essentially teaching them in movies. In an essay of hers titled The Goal of My Writing, Rand stated that she was concerned in her fiction writing with the projection of an ideal man. To achieve this goal, Rand explained how she was required to define and present the conditions which make him possible, which is to say that she had to create a philosophical space in which such an entity could come into or back into and remain in existence. Hence, the creation over her fictional writing career of her philosophy of objectivism. Likewise, in Liberate Yourself from Classical Karate, Bruce stated that his concern in this article was the blossoming of a martial artist. Like Rand, Bruce's own philosophical efforts were born of the same necessity, regarding the need to define and present the conditions which make such an entity possible. For an ideal martial artist can no more blossom in fertile philosophical soil, hence the creation of, in the course of his martial arts training and teaching, this combative philosophy of Jeet Kune Do. I'm not going to pursue this connection to Jeet Kune Do any further than this. But as a final word on the subject, something of a provocation for those of you interested, I'll say that, and it might sound hyperbolic, but I offer it as an experiment that you are more than welcome to test out for yourself. If you were to read Emerson's Self-Reliance, Rand's Atlas Shrug, and Bruce's Liberate Yourself from Classical Karate, I swear you'll think you're reading the thoughts of a single mind. It might sound insane, but it really isn't. As Emerson says in his essay on the Oversoul, the mind is one, and the best minds who love truth for its own sake think much less of property than truth. They accept it thankfully everywhere and do not label or stamp it with any man's name, for it is theirs long beforehand and from eternity. Continuing the same thing, in his essay The Transcendentalist, he adds that the first thing we have to say respecting what are called new views is that they are not new, but the very oldest of thoughts cast into the mold of these new times. The light is always identical in its composition. Anyway, that provocation aside, if Bruce's perfectionist project with Jeet Kune Do was concerned with the blossoming of a martial artist, then I think that it would be both accurate and useful to characterize Bruce's motivation in his film work as the projection of an ideal martial artist. Now, to be clear, when I'm referring to Bruce Lee's film work, I'm referring specifically to the films for which he was the presiding author. I've already had half a dozen conversations with Eric about this, so our interest in Bruce overlap to the point where we're constantly in dialogue and if we're not talking to each other. In his presentation yesterday, he touched on the sense in which and the degree to which you can speak of movies that Bruce Lee was in as Bruce Lee movies. The argument that he laid out yesterday, right there with him for so much of it, but I just, I stopped short of extending Bruce's authorship to either The Big Boss or Fist of Fear. Perhaps, as Aaron brought up, we could think of Bruce as the action director. But for his first two films made on the direction of Low Way, as well as his collaboration with Robert Klaus and Michael Allen on Into the Dragon, to the extent that we could call that fractious trio of collaboration. 
You can identify spots of Bruce's influence. You can, for instance, absolutely speak of Bruce as authoring his fight sequences, as well as contributing lines to the script in the interest of his characterizations. But you just you can't speak of those films as Bruce's own films. To me, you can't. The Way of the Dragon, that is a Bruce Lee movie in that sense. And I would argue that the mark of Bruce's authorship is the fact that The Way of the Dragon is the only film between it, The Big Boss, Fist of Fury, and End of the Dragon that may be characterized as a perfectionist film. The renowned film scholar William Rothman, a former student of Stanley Cavell's and currently one of the two foremost Cavellian scholars expounding on perfectionist philosophy in the cinematic domain, along with a guy named David Broderick, who introduced me to perfectionism, Rothman explains that what it means for a film to be a perfectionist film is both that its author, in creating it, took a step on the path towards his untamed attainable self, and that the film calls on viewers to do so as well. In my mind, that is a perfect description of The Way of the Dragon. I have no idea if Rothman even watches Bruce Lee movies, but he might as well be talking about The Way of the Dragon. As Bruce explicitly stated in the 1972 interview, he wanted to use filmmaking as a means to express his ideals. That was literally what he set out to do. As far as the expression of his ideals goes, John Will has characterized Bruce's work as emphasizing the individual's personal quest toward enlightenment, over the course of which the heroic protagonist has to pass through a series of trials or tests each of which would teach him something about himself and, by extension, about life. This was the thematic thrust of literally everything ever authored by Bruce. Silent Flute, which he worked on with Sterling Silva, Northern Light, Southern Fist, which he rewrote himself, uh, which he and extensively revised the original uh, plot of the Silent Flute, The Way of the Dragon, The Game of Death. Anyone or all of them, that characterization for little fits perfectly. Limiting myself to The Way of the Dragon and The Game of Death, the two films that Bruce actually made or at least started to make. It's worth mentioning, in order to get a handle on the typical plot structure that Bruce seemed to seek in order to convey the type of thematic arguments that he wanted, that both The Way to Dragon and The Game of Death can be understood with reference to what Joseph Campbell referred to as the monument, or the hero's journey, the tripartite structure which consists of departure, a hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Initiation, fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won, and return. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. Now, the Game of Death, such as we know of the film that it was supposed to be, would have been the first film in which Bruce would have been able to project an ideal martial artist in these precise monolithical terms. Bruce intended to offer the film, broadly speaking, as an allegory of stultification in the martial arts, in which a series of stultified martial artist antagonists would serve as foils for Bruce's liberated martial artist protagonist. By comparison, the way the dragon may seem considerably less ambitious, even pedestrian. Sadly, that's kind of majority opinion on the film, I think. I've never taken a dual poll or anything. No. <laughs> no? <laughs> Good. I like this audience. So it's not typically outside of this room of brilliant minds, regarded very highly outside of the Coliseum fight scene. It's usually discussed in patronizing and condescending terms of best or at worst, it's flat out ridiculed and criticized as a bad movie, which is just imagine. One of our esteemed keynote, Professor Xiu Wang, has expressed his opinion that The Way of the Dragon is the ultimate Bruce Lee film, and that the best of his films. I'm happy to be able to report that I'm in such good company and sharing that opinion. And I found it especially regrettable that not a single person has recognized the perfectionist thrust of the film. In the second half of my presentation, I'd like to start working on rectifying this reference. As I conceive of this film, The Way of the Dragon is not as straightforward a rendition of the departure, initiation, return triptych as The Game of Death. In terms of plot structure, The Way of the Dragon focuses exclusively on the first leg of the hero's journey, from the initial call to adventure to the crossing of the first threshold. In other words, if The Game of Death would have been the first film in which Lee would have been able to project an ideal martial artist in full Campbellian form, then The Way of the Dragon is the cinematic equivalent of Liberate Yourself from Classical Karate. In the figure of Tom Loom, Bruce offers a foundational disposition on the necessary philosophical, psychological, and physical conditions of possibility for the blossoming of an ideal martial arts. Now, although there's a lot that I want to say about the way of dragon, I'm going to limit this discussion to Bruce's characterization of Tom Loom and his perfectionist arc over the course of the film. Earlier, I brought up Cavell's articulation of the Aristotelian notion that it's as if each thing that exists is striving to become what it is, to realize itself. For Bruce's part, his way into this type of perfectionist dimension of, to borrow a phrase from Emerson, the upbuilding of man, was actually more through psychology than philosophy. Now, as an aside, I'm very much in agreement with Cavell, who himself was inspired by the German philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, that it's incumbent on philosophers to recognize that their practice ought to be, in the best cases is, therapeutic in aim. 
As Cavell frames it, contemporary philosophy ought to seek continuity with the ancient wish of philosophy to lead the soul, imprisoned and distorted by confusion and darkness, into the freedom of the day. Or, as Matt Polly phrased it yesterday, it should be a mechanism for self-correcting. Brilliant phrase, we got it down immediately. I think that philosophy and psychology should, and in the best cases do, work hand in hand in the Emersonian project of upbuilding professional individuals. From this perspective, it's hardly surprising that Bruce was exposed to ideas conducive to this project and studying the writings of psychologists like Carl Jung, Fritz Perls, and Carl Rogers. Rogers, in particular, was a tremendous influence on Bruce. Of course, Rogers is arguably the most influential psychologist of the 20th century, outside of people like Jean Piaget. His 1961 book, On Becoming a Person, which, according to John Little, was a book not just owned by Bruce, but which Bruce is pretty much underlined from cover to cover. Rogers explicitly laid out the fundamental tenet of his clinical philosophy in the following terms. The individual has within himself the capacity and the tendency, latent if not evident, to move forward toward maturity. Whether one calls it a growth tendency, a drive toward self-actualization, or forward-moving directional tendency, it is the mainspring of life. It is the urge which is evident in all organic and human life to expand, extend, become autonomous, develop, mature. The tendency to express and activate all the capacities of the organism to the extent that such activation enhances the organism of the self. Brian Thorne, in his book aptly titled On Carl Rogers, adds that it was important to Rogers to acknowledge that this perspective, this notion of an actual identity, whatever you want to call it, was the opposite of unique. It was so obvious to the point of being self evident. Thorne's words, the actualizing tendency, runs through all of Abraham Maslow's writings and is reflected in the work of biologists such as Albert Sven Gerge, who concluded that there's definitely a drive to perfection in all living matter. Serendipitous appearance of the word perfection had to quote that guy. James Bishop, in his Bruce Lee book Dynamic Becoming, addresses this aspect of Bruce's thinking, concludes that Bruce's interest in self actualization was a simple realization of the truth of organismic development. You might be thinking to yourself, this is biologically determined. This actualizing tendency, whatever the hell I'm going on about, is encoded in our DNA or something. Then why make such a big deal about it? The answer is contained in a key portion of that Rogers quote, where he says that the individual has within himself the capacity and the tendency, latent if not evident, to move forward. That it can be latent is an indication that it's not biologically determined in the sense that it functions automatically and always the beating of our hearts. Volition is a prerequisite to self actualization. If an individual is committed to a perfectionist philosophy of life, then he must choose and must work to actualize himself. Now, depending on the person, that can be a hell of a daunting proposition. Carl Jung observed in his 1957 book, The Undiscovered Self, that the devaluation of the psyche and other resistances to psychological enlightenment are based in large measure on fear, on panic fear of the discoveries that might be made in the realm of the unconscious. Often the fear is so great, one dares not admit it even to oneself. He observed further that this fear is nothing compared to the enormous effort it usually costs people to help the first stirrings of individuality into consciousness, let alone put them into effect. Accordingly, to Jung's mind, an individual has, in my problems, reached perfection. Once he has the moral courage to act on his own insight and decision, and not from the mere wish to copy convention, even if he happens to agree with collective opinion, unless he stands firmly on his own two feet, the so-called objective values profit him nothing, since they then only serve as a substitute for character. If here in Jung you're hearing echoes of Aristotle, his emphasis on character, of Emerson, who in self-reliance claims that the virtue in most requests is conformity, self-reliance is its aversion, of Rand, who in Atlas Shrug maintains that an error made on your own is safer than ten truths except that on faith, because the first leaves you the means to correct it, but the second destroys your capacity to distinguish truth from error, and of Bruce, who liberate yourself from classical karate, lamented that unfortunately most students in the martial arts are conformists, who instead of learning to depend on themselves, blindly follow their instructors, no longer feeling alone and finding security in mass limitation. And you're starting to see how other pieces of this perfectionist puzzle can come together. Another important piece is provided by Fritz Perls. In an undated journal entry in which he can be seen to be working through the insights gleaned from Perls' Gestalt therapy, Bruce notes Perls' contention that the basic phobic attitude is to be afraid to be what you are. As I shift now to the way of the dragon, all of the pieces of this perfectionist policy are relevant to illuminate, but that line from Perls is truly the touchstone of Bruce's perfectionist characterization of Tom. Contrary to the characters he played in the big boss in Fist of Fury, whom Bruce characterized as simple and lacking much nuance beyond their quest for revenge, Bruce expressed the desire to play somebody with a little more depth, taking the opportunity to craft a character for himself as the writer, producer, director, star, and many other hats he wore in that production. Bruce was intrigued by the prospect of playing a character stuck at this Perlsian impasse. In an interview, Bruce spoke of his character in The Way of the Dragon in the following manner. He's a simple man, like the characters he played in Big Boss Fist of Fury, but he likes to act big. He doesn't really understand a metropolis like Rome, but he pretends that he does. He doesn't want to appear to country punk. 
At the start of the film, this added dimension to the character provides Bruce with fertile ground for comedy. Some people think the opening scenes are stupid and indulgent silliness detached from the narrative proper. But it's important to realize that Bruce sets a crucial precedent in the opening scenes with respect to Tom's characterization. His buffoonery is a crucial element to the characterization of Tom, and an indispensable thread weaved throughout the overarching plot as Bruce tracks Tom's perfectionist growth and his transcendence for Rosie and Empath. After he's picked up at the airport by Chen and given the rundown on her problem with gangsters pressuring her to sell the restaurant, Chen takes Tom back to her apartment so that he can drop off his things and make a situation. I get technological decision. Picture time. Used to living in the new territories in the Hong Kong countryside, Tom is discernibly uneasy upon entering Chen's swanky apartment. By far the shrewdest film critic to focus attention on Bruce's films, Lou Gall rightly identifies in the way of dragon an interior exterior dialectic in Bruce's mise en scène, the whole construction of the film. And this is evident in this scene as Tom, the fighting animal whose primitive fighting prowess necessitates a wild, open area where his spirit can soar, and falls a of prose, is confined to a bizarre and disconcerting interior space. Bruce frames himself in great depth so as to appear vulnerable, and the positioning of the two angled chairs is such that he appears really trapped in that bizarre environment. A series of scenes follows in which Tom continues to make obvious his anachronistic presence and commit embarrassing full hops. Tom's embarrassment crescendos with his first encounter with the gangsters. Predisposed upon their entrance, Tom is not present when the gangsters scare off the lunch crowd and threaten Shannon's staff. When he finally shows up, bumps into Boss's stooge, only he has no idea that he's one of the bad guys. Assuming he's just a nice, ordinary customer, Tom exchanges innocuous pleasantries with him, says goodbye to him, turns to Chen and the staff, and an innocent grin, only to be berated by Chen again and rebuffed by the staff. Poor Tom, he cannot catch a break for the first like 45 minutes of that movie. At this point in the film, Tom is ostensibly acquiesced to his outsider status. And Bruce reinforces this with the blocking the cinematography in the next scene. After cutting to an exterior shot of the restaurant to show that night has fallen, Bruce cuts to a medium close-up of Tom sitting by himself and pouting at a corner table in the restaurant. From here, Bruce pans to a long shot of all the other employees sitting together in the middle of the restaurant. When a group of the gangsters returns to cause more trouble, the framing shows two distinct groupings. The gangsters forming one group and the restaurant staff forming the other. Tom noticeably outside of both groups, and seated by himself in the same isolated corner of the restaurant. Jimmy, one of the restaurant employees, asked the thugs to step outside. First, despite the realm of combat being a place where Tom theoretically should finally be of some use, Bruce's frame propagates Tom's outsider position. With the restaurant staff facing off against the gangsters in the restaurant back alley, Tom is still noticeably the farthest removed of the frame, isolated at the back right edge, obviously still with much to prove if he wants to be accepted in this environment. After Jimmy proves his inferiority, Tom steps in to establish his dominion. Stopping Tony from challenging the gangsters after Jimmy, Tom motions for the staffers to move out of his way, literally forcing himself from the outside edge of the frame to center stage. Tom finally ceases to be intimidated by his environment, i.e. transcends the impasse of his phobic attitude of fearing being who and what he is, asserts his self-confidence, and proceeds to dispatch the four overmatched thugs with ease. Whereas Gaul's previously noted observation regarding the centrality of the interior exterior dialect of all the nerdy stuff, while that's indisputable, what he misses is the resolution of this conflict as a result of his fight scene. With the success of the first fight scene, Tom ceases to be inhibited by his surroundings. In the next several scenes, Tom is significantly never relegated to the back, up to the back of the frame, nor is he pushed to its deepest creatures. Instead, Tom frequently occupies the center of the frame space, with characters eagerly hovering around him or pushing him into the foreground. Added to which, Returning once again to the perfectionist path being traveled by Tom through this film, Tom's whole demeanor changes upon the transcending that pros the impacts. One of Bruce's most inspired decisions in terms of integrating his thematic concerns with the plot is in the way that rather than having each fight scene represent one of his heroic protagonist's mythological tests, Bruce ingeniously forces Tom to endure tests of character, such as those involving the interactions with Chen and the restaurant staff, tests of self-esteem, the challenge his reliance on himself, the success of which are then indexed, indexed in his combative successes. In his essay, Heroism, Emerson asserts that self-trust is the essence of heroism, and he describes heroes as possessed of such a strength of character that no disturbances can shake his will, but pleasantly and as it were merrily he advances to his own view. In the other portions of The Way of the Dragon, this is very clearly not Tom. At the low point at which he's isolated in the corner of the restaurant, he's pouting and sulking. In Walden, Thoreau, not insignificantly a disciple of Emerson's, posits that every man has to learn the points of compass again as often as he awakes. From this perspective, upon regaining his self-esteem, or Thoreau being vain, upon relearning his points of compass, Tom comes into his own as a perfectionist hero. 
Gall mentions how the way of the dragon features one of the rare times Lee really lights up on screen with a smile, bringing an almost childlike glee to the film that spotlights a very different facet of the star's personality. Interestingly, providing a perfect integration of his real-life personality with his characterization of Tom, just as Bruce was recorded by an interviewer to have been prone to spontaneously start whistling a theme and keeping beat on a coffee table like a happy kid, so Tom, in the way of the dragon frequently goes by his days whistling, merrily advancing to his own music. Related to Bruce's fascination with pearls and gestalt therapy, the nature of Bruce's perfectionist characterization of Tom also has much in common with what Eric Hoffer described as the autonomous individual. Per Hoffer, the autonomous individual is an individual who is on his own, striving to realize himself and prove his worth. Hoffer notes a dangerous element in the presence of the, in, in presence of the autonomous individual, insofar as he is stable only so long as he's possessed of self-esteem, the acquirement and maintenance of which is a continuous tax which taxes all of the individual's power and inner resources. This makes a volcanic landscape of his soul, through which there runs a seismic line along which all his enthusiasm, passionate pursuits, dreams, aspirations, and outstanding achievements have their origin. Echoing Thoreau, Hoffer averts that the confidence and self-esteem which alone can keep him on an even keel are extremely perishable and must be generated anew each day. Thus, an achievement today is but a challenge for tomorrow. In the early sequences of The Way of the Dragon, there is considerable activity along the fall line of Tom's volcanic character. As the film progresses, he successfully regains and maintains, via the exercise of his power and inner resources, his confidence and self-esteem. By the end of the film, his many achievements become a challenge, and Tom, come into his own as a perfectionist hero, the volcanic instability of his character, transformed into what Emerson described as the soul at war, accepts the challenge that is presented to him in the form of Colt, a gladiatory villain played by Megan's hero Chuck Norris. The climax of the film is the point at which, as Campbell puts it in the context of the hero's journey, the familiar life horizon has been outgrown, and the time for the passing of the threshold is at hand. In the course of an extraordinarily assiduous and astute exegesis of mythological archetypes and the psychological significance, Jordan Peterson postulates that on the one hand, the spirit forever willing to risk personal, more abstractly intrapsychic, destruction to gain redemptive knowledge might be considered the archetypal representative of the adaptive process as such. And that on the other hand, a new manner of dealing that is behaving with regard to or classifying an emergent unknown is the gift of the hero. Against this backdrop, the climactic confrontation in which Tom risks personal and intrapsychic destruction by facing off against the emergent unknown in cult represents for Tom the threshold beyond which will appear a turn towards new terrain in his perfection's journey. As elucidated by Campbell, the original departure into the land of trials represents only the beginning of the long and really perilous path of initiatory conquests and moments of illumination on which dragons will have to be slain and surprising barriers passed, again, again, and again. Whether or not Tong will make the turn onto that path, whether he is of the heroic stature needed to be able to slay dragons, depends on his having successfully transcended the Perlzian impasse and embraced the self-reliant position from which to welcome the Therovian challenge of having to continually relearn his points of compass. Of course, he is of such a heroic stature. He welcomes and meets the Therovian challenge, and at the end of the film, he departs to continue walking, literally, the path to his unattained but attainable self. On that note, I'll give the last word to Emerson. I think captures this final formulation, in this formulation, the power of Bruce Lee to captivate, and what is so captivating about this final image of Bruce Lee ascending. He stands to all beholders like a transparent object betwixt them and the sun, and whoso journeys towards the sun, journeys towards that person. I appreciate you accompanying me on this journey towards Bruce Lee and the sun. Listen. <laughs>